Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Blue is the New White podcast. I'm really excited for my guest today. He's an incredible human who also is a huge advocate of the skilled trades. Neil Thompson is the founder of Teach the Geek, not in the skilled trades in the traditional sense, but definitely serves the trades in so many ways. Neil and I have been connected on uh, LinkedIn for quite some time now, and many of my past guests have actually come on the recommendation of his as well. So he's got a storied past, getting his master's degree in biomedical engineering, really because of the persuasion and influence of his father. While going for his PhD, however, he decided enough was enough and left college. He spent many years in the field, ending up in orthobiologics. If you don't know what that is, keep listening. Once he realized that entrepreneurship was his calling, he started Teach the Geek, where he helps STEM professionals hone their public speaking skills. So listen, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and on our website at bluesthenewwhite.com to receive all the latest updates. You can now find this podcast on iHeartRadio, Sirius XM, and Pandora. As always, we rely on the word of mouth of our listeners to further the mission. That's you. So if you enjoy this episode, please take a minute to rate it, review it, and share it with anyone who might find it interesting. The future generations of tradespeople depend on it. They depend on you. So thank you again and enjoy this episode of Blue is the New White with the great Neil Thompson. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Blue is the New White podcast. Really excited about my guest today. We've actually been connected on LinkedIn for a couple of years now, and some of my past guests have actually come on a recommendation from this gentleman who gets to join us today. I'm really excited to finally be able to talk with him. I know he's got some really great perspectives on the skilled trades and, and uh, really great ideas and, and uh, tactics that can help people in the skilled trades as well. So uh, without further ado, Neil, welcome to the Blues New White podcast, sir. Thanks for having me, Josh. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm super excited to, uh, to have this conversation. So before we get into, you know, too much of this, the, the questions back and forth, I kind of just want to get an idea uh, for myself and, and for the audience of who you are, right? Uh, what do you do? How'd you get there? And, and, you know, where you came from? Sure. Well, thank you for, for having me again. And, and when it comes to my perspectives, maybe you like them because they're kind of similar to your own. Yeah, that's, that's possible. <laughs> well, more about myself. I started off as an engineer. I went to school for engineering and I became an engineer because my father said I should. <laughs> that's, I used to lie about that because I was embarrassed by the reasoning. Because I, whenever I heard other people talk about why they became engineers, it was always an interesting story. Maybe they were in robotics club when they were in high school. Maybe they took apart their toaster when they were kids <laughs> or played with Legos. I, I don't recall playing with Legos. My mother wouldn't have been happy if I took apart the toaster, so I left it alone. <laughs> and I, I definitely was not in a robotics club because my high school didn't have one. The sole reason I became an engineer was because my father said become one, and I had no other ideas as to what I wanted to do after high school. So I went into engineering. I got a degree in materials engineering, and then my father said, go do a master's. So I said, all right, master's it is. So then I went and did a master's in biomedical engineering. And then my father said, go do a PhD. And I said, all right, PhD it is, but it wasn't PhD it is. I started off the <laughs> PhD program and after a year I decided I didn't want to be in a PhD program anymore. At this point, I was 24, 25 years old. I wasn't the same 18 year old that started college. And at some point you have to start living your life for yourself, not what other people want for you or tell you what or tell you to do, parents included. Yeah. So I left the program after a year I moved back in with my father into his two bedroom condo. He wasn't too happy about that, but I knew I had to, I had to get a job because I, I didn't want to be in that condo for very long. I mean, I didn't even unpack my boxes with, with my luggage. I used to keep all, all my clothes in, in the, in the, in the boxes and in the luggage because I thought I'll get a job soon, but it actually took me about seven months to get a job. And once I, I finally did, I, I worked as a research associate at a startup company at a small medical device startup company. And I did that for a couple of years. I didn't like my boss all that much, although we're cool now. But I, <laughs> <laughs> but I left that job and, and I moved out here to the California where I am currently. And that was about 15 years ago. Before that, I was in the Boston area. 
So basically, I've been in medical devices this entire time, more specifically spinal implants, more specifically orthobiologics. And for those of you all that don't know what orthobiologics is, spinal implants can be made out of a number of materials. They can be made from ceramics, metals, but they can also be made out of human cadaver bone. So I actually was one of the engineers who was involved with designing implants, spinal implants, out of human cadaver bone. So if you're an organ donor, your, your your bones may be used to help other people. And I and I can take those bones and make them into implants to help those people. Wow. And so that that was really interesting work. And I, I did that for a number of years, several years, maybe close to 10. And then I realized that I didn't want to be an employee anymore. Again, I just wanted to make this change. I wanted to work for myself and, and work on the things that I wanted to work on. And the I started a business called Teach the Geek. And the, the whole idea of Teach the Geek came from back when I worked as an engineer, I had to give presentations in front of management and I wasn't very good at it. I noticed a lot of the other engineers weren't all that much better at it than I was, but I got a lot better at it over time. And I basically took everything that I learned in, in improving my, my public speaking skills, my presentation skills, and I turned it into a, an online course called Teach the Geek to Speak. And I geared it towards technical people like myself who had to give presentations in front of people, especially non-technical audiences, and basically what we could do to get better at it. And, and that's where it all started for me. And then maybe a couple of years after that, I decided to write a children's book and it's called Ask Uncle Neil, Why Is My Hair Curly? It's about my nephew asking me why his hair is the way it is. And I use science to answer the question. Eventually I want to turn that into a series in which my nephew asks me a question and I use science to answer it. And the goal for even writing the book was for more black children to actually consider careers in STEM. And when I when I talk about co considering careers in STEM, it's really, I, I choose those words carefully because there's a big push to get more children, you know, children from various groups to go into go into STEM because their groups are underrepresented in those groups or underrepresented in those fields. But if you don't have the interest and you're not willing to do the work then you really shouldn't be in that field anyway. And that, that's for skill trades, that's for STEM, that's, that's for anything. And so I'm, I'm really big on just letting them know that STEM is an option for you. It's not off limits to you. It's, it's, it's possible for everyone. But if there's another track that you want to go down, then that's, then that's fine. That's, that's fine too. So that's basically my story, Josh. <laughs> that's incredible, Neil. I, I had no idea that it was that, <laughs> that extensive. But you know what? I mean, I, that's why I love having guests like you on the show because I get to learn you know, about what makes you, you, and that's fantastic. And, and, and I think that, uh, um, man, I'm excited to, to get into this. So I'm, I'm curious, first and foremost, you know, you said your, your, your dad wanted you to become an engineer. Your dad wanted you to get a master's. Your dad wanted you to get your PhD, but then you didn't, and you moved back in with him. I'm, I'm a little curious if you wouldn't mind sharing, uh, because I think that there's a lot of people in a similar boat right, that, uh, that they, they have influence from those closest to them. And I want to know how that conversation went with your, with your dad and, and how you were able to navigate it, if you don't mind sharing. So maybe others can glean some insight as well. Well, he wasn't too happy about it. And this was back in 2005. So that's 18 years ago and also almost 20 years ago now. And it wouldn't surprise me if he's still upset about it. <laughs> <I'm very honest. laughs> because he wanted all of his children. So I have two sisters. So there's three of us. And he wanted all of us to go into, into STEM. I mean, he didn't necessarily want my sisters to become engineers for some reason. I'm not sure why, but he wanted them to have STEM degrees as well. So I have an older sister. She actually started off as a, as a STEM major. I think she did chemistry. And then she switched to biology and then she dropped out altogether. But she ended up getting a degree in human resources. And now she's the the head, I guess she's the chief people officer at the company she works at. And, and she's doing really well. I, even though she she has this job, I'm, I'm sure he's still a little annoyed <laughs> that she didn't get the, the STEM degree like, as he wanted. And then I have a younger sister and I think she did actually get a biology degree, but never really used it. She works as a project manager. So, I mean, <laughs> none of them really used, none of them really went into STEM. I'm the only one to actually did go into STEM and I, I did two of the three. So, you know, okay, <laughs> you know I did okay. the bachelor's and the master's. So, you know, <laughs> two of the three ain't bad. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad at all, man. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's that's really interesting. So was there a moment then that you can recall uh, while you were going for your PhD that was like the breaking point, you know, that, that led to you just saying, listen, 
I, I, I can't, I can't do this part. I don't want to, I want to do something different. Was there one thing that you can attribute it to, or was it something that had kind of built over the years that you felt? And then finally you were just like, listen, I got to do something for me. Oh no, there definitely was one thing. So I remember going home for, I think it was Christmas and I was, I was at one of my friend's condos. This is a guy that I went to undergrad with. So he, he went straight to industry. I think he got a job at IBM. So he's working as an engineer, making good money. And I'm here in this, this PhD program, not making good money. And I remember they all, him and his friends were playing poker and they're using, and they're playing for money. So they're actually, you know, they could, because they got salaries, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 they're got chips and they're making, paying money for the chips. And I just had to sit there and watch because I couldn't play because I had no money to play. And I remember at the time thinking, this sucks. <laughs> I want money to play too. <laughs> like, to hell this PhD program. <laughs> I'm, I'm out of here. It wasn't too long after that. I mean, I was actually prepared to leave the PhD program with nothing, but it was actually my advisor who said, if you take this one class, and he said the class I had to take, it was a biostatistics class. You take this one class, you'll have enough credits to get a master's degree, and then you can leave this school with a master's. I said, okay. So then I, I took the class, got the master's, and I was out of there. Oh, okay. All right. Super interesting. So then, so then you, you, you moved to California, you were working with these spinal implants, the orthobiologics. That's the first time I've ever heard that word in my life, by the way. And uh, so it's, it's really, really interesting. I'm glad that you kind of explained what that was. Cause if, if you hadn't, that would be my next question. Um, that's, that's really interesting. And, and before we kind of move on in your story, I want to know what the biggest thing from that line of work, what was the biggest thing you learned from that kind of work? Is there, I mean, there's probably a bunch, right? It might be a broad question, you know, but I'm always curious as to what somebody's takeaway from something like that was. Bone stinks. <laughs> okay. If you ever go into a tissue bank and and you smell it being cut, it's the it's a smell that you'll never forget. And it just it wow. infiltrates your nostrils. And you can't get rid of it for, for hours afterwards. It's because people are people are fat. So you have to render all that fat from the bone before you can even cut it. So even that stinks. It's the whole the whole oh operation is just a smelly operation. Gosh. So if, if, if it was one takeaway, that certainly would be it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. All right, good. That, <laughs> I'm good. That's oh wow. Okay, cool. Well, hey, listen, that is that is something kind of kind of cool that you can. Uh, I'm sure you've got a, a ton of stories. I'm not going to ask because uh, that last one was just <laughs> just fine. But uh, but that's definitely an interesting line of work. So so then I'm curious, after doing that for a while, why didn't you want to be an employee anymore? What was it uh, about entrepreneurship that 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 was your calling? Why? Because I get to I get to make the rules. When you're an employee, you have to do what you're told to do. And sometimes I was told to do things I didn't really agree with, but because I wanted to keep the job, I, I did them. And looking back on it, I wish I had. I wish I hadn't. And, but because I, because I was this employee and I wanted to keep my job, I, I did those things. But now working for myself, I get to, I get to decide what I'm comfortable with, what I'm not comfortable with, what I'm willing to do, what I'm not willing to do. And I, I really wanted that control. And then I also wanted the flexibility, especially now, you know, we're coming out of COVID, you know, people were working remotely for quite some time. And now some companies are requiring them to come back to the office or work hybridly. I didn't want to be in that position where someone was telling me where I had to work too. So that, that definitely, that definitely factored into why I stay being an entrepreneur working for myself. Okay. Okay. So, so is that, or is, is COVID or, or is that around when you started your business? Well, actually I, I started it before. So, it, but, but I, I, as I said, why I stay as an entrepreneur because it's, it's a hard life. I mean, you, you have to constantly be looking for, for work. You're not getting paid every other week. Like you were, like you would as an employee. So yeah. the fact that I have to con constantly be prospecting can be can, can wear people down, and, and maybe some people don't wouldn't want it to have to be responsible for that. And but but because I don't want to be told what to do, because I, I don't want to be told where I have to work, because I don't want to be told what I'm going to be paid, because I don't want to be told when I can take, I don't want to have to ask people when I can take vacation. I basically. I'm a terrible employee is what it comes down to, Josh. <laughs> I have to be an entrepreneur. It's the only way. You know what? It's so funny you say that because there are some people built that way, 
right? Just like there's some people built to in in the employee model that they thrive in that, right? Like the, uh, I, I mean, even the entrepreneurs is what they they call them, right? The C-suite executives that pour their heart and soul into a business that isn't theirs. You know, that could never be me. I can't, I can't do that. I've got people like that, and thank goodness that people like that exist. You know, but to your point, I mean, there are some people that are just, you know, cut from a different cloth, and and that does not resonate. And uh, I think you and I are very similar in that aspect because at this point, I'm telling you right now that, uh, yeah, nobody would want me as an employee. <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with you, my friend. Okay. All right, cool. So so that's why, so that's a, a lot of good reasons why uh, why you left and why you started your business. I imagine that, you know, I, I, I like the premise of your, of your business. You found a need and you aimed to fill it. And that need is really helping people. We're going to get a little bit more into this later, but, but I just want to know real quick, I mean, how fulfilling is what you do? Oh, it's, it's extremely fulfilling. I mean, I, saw, I first saw the need in myself. And so me getting better at giving presentations in front of others, I, I, it was like night and day. I mean, those first few presentations I had to give, I didn't know it was possible to sweat that profusely from one's body. <laughs> and, and what made it even worse is I get questions after the presentations that I thought I had answered during the presentation. Because so if I was sweating before, now I'm just, now it's just like I, jumped, like, like I just jumped out the shower. It was, it was gross. <laughs> I mean, the flop stuff was ridiculous. But then once I got better at it, I saw all the, the opportunities that came with me getting better at giving presentations and just being able to present in front of others. Because I, as I mentioned, the other engineers weren't all that much better at it than I was. So if I was the engineer that actually could stand out by, by being one of those engineers that actually could speak in front of the management, in front of other decision makers, just in front of non-technical people generally, it, it helped to increase my visibility within the company. But then once I, I left, corporate America, I guess I started working for myself. It's not as if that was a skill that wasn't going, wasn't going to benefit me because I still have to, well, now it's even more important, I would argue, because I have a podcast. So I talk to people with my podcast. So that's important there. I have to prospect. So when I, when I talk to people in that way, I have to speak to the people as well. And I do presentations all the time with Teach the Geek. And, and so I, it's important for me to be the, the example you know, wouldn't it be weird if, if I'm telling people they need to improve their presentation skills and my presentation skills were whack? <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be pretty, be pretty weird. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, it, it's certainly it's certainly fulfilling, especially when people when they take on or or, or adopt some of the suggestions that I have in, in getting better at giving presentations or public speaking generally, and they see a benefit to them, then it, it's certainly worthwhile. And it, it makes me think that I, it, it was something that was worth pursuing. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and we're gonna get into uh, how that can be of use in the in the industries that we talk about uh, in in a little bit. But before we before we do that, I want to transition to something you said that uh, of uh, you know between you and your two sisters, you were the only one that really used your degree as intended, right? So that's about a thirty percent, thirty three percent ratio, which is basically in line, right, with the national average of how many people actually use a degree closely related to their major. So, you know, it's an, it's an interesting statistic that you, that you put out there because, you know, this seems to be, I don't know if we want to call it a problem, but it doesn't seem to be working all that well. Right. So I don't know what else to call it. So I'm curious from your perspective, you know, I, I mean, just college in general, you know, the way that it's marketed, the way that it's positioned, the way that people are persuaded to go to college what do you see out there and and what are the effects on 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 the nation because of it well you get people getting degrees and as you mentioned they get these degrees and then they end up in jobs that didn't require those degrees and in a lot of cases people took out loans to go to the colleges and colleges at least in the US are quite expensive and so now you're you might be a bit disgruntled knowing that you're working a job that didn't require the degree that you got but you still have all these monthly student loans that you have to pay back for this degree and I and if I was in that position, I would have been really upset. Luckily, I was able to pay off my loans really quickly. But if you went to a, an expensive school, I mean, 18 years old, you're making a decision to, to that will affect you for, for years to come. And you may think, well, I want to go to this, this, top, this top tier school. It might be a private school. 
high school is always more expensive. I had to take out all these loans to go to this school, but you're not thinking about having to pay that money back when, when you're actually done. And you could defer maybe based on in certain criteria, but ultimately you're going to be responsible for that loan. And, and not only that, but you can't discharge these loans in bankruptcy even. So you're always going to have this, these loans to pay back no matter what. And, and it's so it's so unfortunate that we push this and we push it telling these students that you're not a success unless you go to college. And that's just not true. There's more, more than enough people who work in the skilled trades, who didn't have to take out any loans at all, who got paid to learn through apprenticeships, and they are in the, they're firmly in the middle class. They, they own homes, they, they, own, they may own businesses themselves. They, they, they're doing great, but we don't push, we don't really push that much. We, we tell kids, go to college, go to college. If you don't go to college, you're not living up to your potential. And it's just, it's just a, it's a wrong-headed way to look at it. Yeah. As you know, I, I couldn't agree more. And and I want to remind, because I haven't said that for a while on this show, so I'm glad you brought it up. But I want to remind the my audience out there that that Neil is absolutely right. You cannot discharge student loans in bankruptcy. If you go bankrupt, you still have to pay your student loans. It's it, it's a pretty wild thing to think about. You know, but that that is definitely a stipulation of those uh, of those student loans, and not many people know that. So that that's one thing. And so, you know, I I tend to agree with you. There's a lot of uh, professions out there that don't require a college degree. In fact, I literally five minutes before this podcast uh, just got off a call with a uh, school out in Maine. A teacher asked me to come talk to her class. You know, and it's amazing. You know. They they each were able to come up uh, one by one and ask me questions and it's it's amazing the type of mindset that uh, that they have. I mean the, this this teacher is very forward thinking and obviously you know if she's reaching out to me she probably is of the right mindset you know. Uh, but it, but it's amazing you know just to hear the ambition the drive you know the 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 hope that that these kids have about their future, you know, and, and only some of them talked about college. Like there was one, one kid that was an exchange student from Brazil who wanted to be a doctor. Some professions you have to go to college. If you know from a young age that you want to be a doctor, you've got to go to college. And there's, there's, there's no shame in that, right? But it's about the ROI, not only the ROI monetarily, right? The fiduciary ROI, but the one that can create fulfillment for you and happiness for you. And so you're not going through the motions every day of your life, you know, just thinking that you're living somebody else's version of success. Anyway, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole here. I'm going to reel myself back in. But to your point, you know, it is, uh, it's definitely something that I think needs to be addressed and people like us just need to keep having conversations about it. So there, before the podcast, we were talking about some alternatives to college that we're hoping uh, get more recognized, right? Get more recognition and tech being one of those things that previously required a college education, but now maybe not. And so I'm, I'm leaning into classifying this into a, a version of a skilled trade. So you want to talk a little bit on, on that and what you're seeing from that aspect? Sure. So the idea of coding boot or coding boot camps have have popped up all over the country within the last few years, and they're basically this alternative to getting a computer science or a computer engineering or a software engineering degree, you know, for one of these four year degrees from colleges. And the idea is you go through these boot camps; they can last for as long as maybe a year, maybe and, and as little as as maybe three six months. But once you graduate from one of these coding boot camps, you essentially have the skills to be a, a junior developer or a junior software engineer, a junior computer engineer. And there are many companies that are amenable to hiring these coding boot camp graduates. And it's a lot cheaper to go to a coding boot camp than to go to a four year institution. And in a lot of cases, the, the, the work that you're doing is very much in line with what's going on in industry anyway. And so there's less of a learning curve when you actually go into industry as opposed to the four-year institutions, which tend to be behind the time some, in, in, in many instances. But un unfortunately, there's still some companies that are, I guess, a bit hesitant to hire these, these, these boot camp grads because they're, they're still the mindset that we need to hire these four-year computer science or computer engineering graduates. And it's so unfortunate. But 
luckily, it, I think the tide is changing, but there are still some dinosaurs out there that that need to be convinced. Yeah, absolutely. I I'm, I agree with you, but I think it's a wonderful concept, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, I don't care what profession you're in. I don't care if it's a skilled trades, if you're a plumber, if you're an HVAC tech, if you're, you know, a contractor, or if you're in tech and, and you know, you're a junior engineer or, you know, coder or, or whatever, you know, if you have the skills to do the job, that should be all that matters, right? Unfortunately, we're, we're up against you know, like to your point, some some old school uh, mindsets and some some other ways of thinking, you know, from some uh, organizations that just don't think that way, right? And, and, you know, they have this underlying requirement of a college degree, even like we were talking before, even if that college degree has nothing to do with, their, with what they're actually hiring you for, the fact that you have a college degree actually puts you in line ahead of some of the people that might have this experience, you know, or or this knowledge needed for the job. It's just sometimes it's just backwards to me. So, uh, yeah, I. And anyway, I'm going to get upset. Let's let's move on. <laughs> no. And, and that's really, really great insight. So I, I want to transition now into. Uh, a little bit more on the blue collar space, right? You had mentioned the skilled trades a couple of times. I know that you're a big advocate of these industries. We've had conversations. You've, you know, introduced me to uh, to guests in the past. So, I mean, how do you view the the skilled trades, the ones that I typically talk to, and their benefit to society? Um, what is what is what's your view on that? I mean, the skilled trades make the world go round. I mean, if you're not a fan of the skilled trades, you're not a fan of life. <laughs> I mean, when you, when you turn on your faucet, does water come out? You flip, you flip the switch on in your house. Do, do lights come on? I mean, you go, you go to the, the gas station and, and, and gas actually comes out of the pump. You, you're probably happy about that, right? I mean, we need people in the skilled trades doing their job because if not, the infrastructure of, of the world would basically come to a halt. So anybody who's not a fan of the skilled trades is 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 foolish and 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 not only that we just it's just when when it, when it comes down to it we need more people that are willing to to go into these fields unfortunately we have this overarching narrative that says that if you do then you're not living up to your potential you need to go to college instead and and that's just not helpful to just the the world generally so i, I i'm i'm a firm believer that the that the that that that, that thought needs to change and that the skill trade needs to be seen in a more elevated position that it currently is. Yeah, and one of my theories, I, I'm, I, I love that answer, especially when you said, if you're not a fan of the skilled trades, you're not a fan of life. I, I'm going to quote you on that. That's the, <laughs> that's really awesome. But I, I tend to agree. And and one of the things that you know I've always said, you've probably heard it on, on my podcast. I think I've said it in the book, right? That the skill trades have a marketing problem. And so here's here's another way of saying that, Neil, and I, and and I think you'll you'll see where I'm going with this. But the skilled trades might have a communication problem, right? And and specifically coming from a lot of the people in the skilled trades, like you've got people like me out there. We've got you know uh, our circle that you've that you've noticed on LinkedIn, and and we've, we're starting to accumulate a lot more people who can effectively speak on the importance of the skilled trades and communicate the benefits of these industries and really paint a picture, you know, to, to the world of what it looks like. And that's a skill, right? That is, that's a, 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 almost an art form that not everybody in these industries understands and not everybody in these industries have those abilities. And you've got some experience on that, right? Because, you know, this is part of what you do is helping people speak and communicate. So how do you see what you do impacting, you know, the skilled trades in general, you know, by helping people with these, these skills, these soft skills? Well, yeah, the soft skills is, it can be the difference between, it's, 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 it's a, it's a huge difference. I, I mentioned that I saw that, that the, the, in myself, the, the, going from this engineer that wasn't all that great at communicating that with one who was much better at it. It, when, once you get better at, at this at communicating, maybe that marketing problem goes away because you're able to communicate the importance of what you do. I mean, I mentioned all these things that the skilled trades are responsible for: the water coming out of your faucet, the lights turning on when you flick the switch, the, the gas coming out of the pump. I mean, these are all part of our everyday lives. And 
for most of us, unless you don't own a car, then maybe it's not part of your, maybe it's not part of your life. But <laughs> the other two are though. I'm pretty sure you drink water and, and you and you live indoors. There's lights so unless unless you're down with candles. Unless you're Amish, maybe I don't know. But uh, <laughs> but but if you are a person who lives in the industrialized world, you you benefit from the skilled trades. And if the skilled trades were better at just communicating their importance to the world, I think that. Maybe the, the idea of college wouldn't be as 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 prevalent as it is, and, and you're right. There's this marketing problem, but becoming better, just more, get more adept at communicating the importance of of the skill trades. I think we all would benefit. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree with that. Is there? Do you see a cultural benefit to this uh, uh, to these skills as well? Oh, for sure. I mean, the the culture would would. <laughs> Would would grind to a halt. I mean, I mean as as I mentioned, we we need each other. Yeah. Certainly, you need people that that work in companies that work in these corporate environments. Perhaps they don't need the degrees that they got to work those jobs, but we need we certainly need employees at companies to to do their jobs so that we can enjoy the the the, the what they what they produce. But we also need the technicians. We need the plumbers. We need we need the HVAC technicians. We need we need electricians. We need these people to do their jobs too. It's it's a symbiosis. We we need each other for all of us to benefit. And when one is 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 promoted over the other, it's it's it, it's damaging to both. We need more of a balance. Yeah, absolutely. And now now follow up question to that: What about a culture inside of an organization? How can they benefit from the people in it being better communicators? Well, I mean, when when the people in inside are better communicators, they're better able to communicate what they need and want from the organization. I remember having a conversation with a, an older woman. I won't name her <laughs> in, case she's, in case she's watching, but she said that she back in the seventies when she was a, a younger person and working in in corporate America, she thought that just being good at her job was enough to be able to move up within the organization. And I recognized even back when she was telling the story that, no, I mean, the people who move up in the organizations are the ones who are able to communicate their value to the organization. And when you think about it, that's the way it has, that's the way it should be. Because do you think people are just paying attention to you all the time in your work? I mean, other people are are, are are thinking about themselves. So if you want them to think about you, you're probably gonna have to tell them about you. And I, <laughs> so I think that's, that's more than reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. And that's an art, right? Because because that's something that I've noticed, especially through my travels of owning a business, right? We we're up to uh, probably 70 plus employees now, right? And and that is something that is very difficult for a lot of people to communicate their own value, right? It either comes off completely wrong and almost like a hostage situation, right? And and there's a lot of hostility and, and hey, I, I deserve this and I deserve that. Right. Or they just don't say anything. And then, you know, because maybe it's an uncomfortable conversation. Right. And, and then uh, they either quit or their work starts to suffer or they're just not happy. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of different results. But if you can properly and confidently articulate your own value to your team, to your employer, to your boss, supervisor, whatever, you know, even your colleagues, there's. I mean, there's value in that in itself. I mean, so so I, I agree with you. I think that there's uh, a lot of impact that could be had, which is why I, I'm just I I just love what you do because I think that it 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 has this this spawning effect, you know, that uh, that can impact the lives of of not only the people that you teach, but the people around those people too. So no, really, really good stuff. Okay, so just a couple more questions for you, man. I know you're a busy guy. I don't want to take too too much of your time, but uh, so next up, what is what's next for for Neil? What is what does the future look like for you? You mentioned a couple more books. You know where where do you want the business to go? Anything that you can share with us? What what does that look like? Well, it's always to, to get into more organizations. So I mentioned with Teach the Geek, I work with with technical professionals so they can present more effectively especially in front of non-technical audiences. So always being able to, to get into more organizations that hire or who have those type of people on staff, technical people who could benefit from just being able to communicate better with, especially with non-technical people. I mean, you mentioned earlier that I mentioned the word orthobiologics. And if, if I hadn't explained what it meant, 
you would have asked me, but I purposely explained what it meant because I realized that maybe a lot of people don't know what orthobiologics is. I certainly didn't know what it meant when I, when I you know, when I first started, it had to be explained to me. So I wouldn't assume that other people just knew that word. It's, it's not a, a regular word you just hear in just regular people's you know, conversations. So just getting into the organizations is something more into more organizations is something to do to do trainings with their staff. That's something that I'm always looking to do more of. And then, as you mentioned, or also mentioned the book, developing more books, making a series where my nephew is asking me a question and I use science to answer it. I mean, those are the, the two things that I, I really focus on. And then also, I mentioned also the, the, the podcast. Uh, I have a podcast called the Teach the Geek podcast, where I interview people with technical backgrounds about their public speaking journeys. And it's always interesting to hear these stories, especially from people who started off in one place and ended up somewhere completely different. The one person that comes to mind, she studied civil engineering, but then it never worked as one. She actually got a civil engineering degree because her father told her to. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's why it stands out to me so much. But then she went to law school and she worked as a lawyer for about five years. And then she was a stay-at-home mom for about 10 years. And now she works as a personal stylist. Wow. Uh, yeah, helping women, women with their wardrobe. And it's like, you couldn't even you couldn't script that. That's yeah. not something I could have thought of in a million years. So just hearing these stories of people is really interesting. So always looking to get more guests that have these technical backgrounds and these interesting stories who want to talk about public speaking. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Well, well, you can be sure that uh, I'll scour my guest list and see uh, who might be good on your show. And you know, I'd be happy to introduce you to some people, um, especially after all the people you've introduced me to. So, <laughs> so now that I know what you're looking for, you know, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Last question. If you've if you've seen the the show before, you probably know what I'm going to ask. But we talk a lot about success, right? We talk a lot about the skilled trades and how the skilled trades can enable people to live their versions of success because everybody's version of success looks just a little bit different. It's not, you know, the uh, the common picture that we that we all paint for everybody and put everybody in this box of hey, we want uh, married, kids, house. You know, white picket fence, golden retriever, you know, one and a half cars, whatever. Uh, everybody has their own version. So I'm curious from you, Neil, overall, how do you describe success? What does that look like to you? Doing what I want. I mean, it really does come down, come down to that. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I left corporate America because I had to live within a certain I guess box of what the company wanted me to do, do things I didn't necessarily want to do. And I didn't want to do that anymore. It, we, you know, I, this is a story that I don't typically tell people, but what really took me away from corporate America was working this contract job. And I was supposed to be there for a year. And five months into the contract, the CEO called me into his office. And I thought he was calling me into his office to tell me what a great job I was doing. <laughs> that wasn't the reason. He, he called me in to tell me that that would be my last day because they wanted to focus more on sales and marketing. I was there doing product development. And I just remember that when I was gathering up my things and driving home, thinking to myself, I never want to be in this position again. And where someone's calling me into their office, telling me that my, my, that was my last day and my services were no longer needed. And so when it comes to the idea of success, it, it certainly wasn't, it wouldn't be moving up within a corporate ladder because that could always happen. You could, you're renting a job, you don't own it. And you could be you could be let go any day, any day now. <laughs> when you, if you're an employee, that that should be your slogan. That should be your mantra. Any day now, <laughs> especially now, when so many tech employees have been laid off at some of the biggest at some of the biggest tech companies. They 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 got that. They they certainly understand that if they didn't understand it before. And so when it comes to the idea of success, I want to do what I want to do. I want to help people. I want to make money doing it. And I, essentially, I just want to be happy. I love that. I love that. That's super transparent. It's it's real. It's authentic. It's you, and uh, and that's that's a perfect answer, Neil. So hey, listen. I I want to thank you so much for for spending your time uh, with me today. I know that it's valuable. For those who don't know where they can find you, where can they find you? You can go to teachthegeek.com, and if you want to check out the podcast, you can go to podcast.teachthegeek.com. Awesome, Neil. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. Thanks again for having me, Josh.